festival like this is a beautiful indication of the kind of uh, thing that I, I truly, truly believe in and I think makes our society uh, more whole and more pure. We do not take it for granted that Boulder was chosen as the first North American uh, satellite festival. Um, it's a huge honor we will not forget and we are enriched because of it. We are indebted to the, both the local and international people that came together to make that happen. And um, we hope it's a tradition that continues for decades to come. Literary festivals like this one build up an environment and an ecosystem to nurture readers and to promote the business of books. They provide an invaluable forum for writers to connect with other creative people. Uh, we sit there peering into uh, those uh, electronic uh, uh, grids in front of our eyes uh, and it only increases the desire to hit, see the real thing in the flesh, uh, to actually hear an author speak firsthand, to read from their work, to hear the tones of their voice uh, modulate as they read their most treasured passages of prose. Uh, for us it's special, this was our mothership and it continues to be. The other editions that we have across the United States are smaller versions, different programming but smaller versions. Welcome back. On behalf of festival co-directors Namata Gokhli and William Dalrymple, Teamwork Arts, Boulder Public Library and the City of Boulder, we welcome you to the second session of JLF Colorado 2020 Virtual Festival. Our second session today is the Himalayas, an ecological battle, Trevor Price and Stephen Alter in conversation. This session is presented in partnership with the University of Chicago Center in Delhi. In an age of extreme climatic disruption, changing migration patterns and ecological damage, a session that spotlights the fragile balance between mankind and nature on the greatest mountain range on the planet. Academic and writer Trevor Price's work focuses on ecology and evolution with a special interest in Himalayan biodiversity. He's the author of Speciation in Birds and many other publications. Writer Stephen Alter is the author of several books, including Wild Himalaya, A Natural History of the Greatest Mountain Range on Earth, which traverses the length and breadth of the massive, interweaving history, environment, myth, and fact. Together, they will discuss the bewildering biodiversity of the Himalayas, as well as the paradoxes of the legal and societal assaults on its ecology. Trevor Price completed his PhD at the University of Michigan in 1984 and then held faculty positions at the University of California, San Diego and the University of Chicago. He first visited India in 1972 and has worked in the Himalayas for the past 30 years studying bird species distributions, including the effects of climate change. Stephen Alter has published more than 20 books of fiction and nonfiction. His book, Wild Himalaya, A Natural History of the Greatest Mountain Range on Earth, was published in August 2019 and is a finalist for the 2020 Banff Book Awards and the Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay NIF Book Prize. His latest novel is Feral Dreams, Mowgli and His Mothers, published in October 2020. Please do follow our handles on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get notified on the upcoming sessions. And unfortunately, but we'd really like to share with you that it's been difficult for us in these really unusual times to come together and bring this festival to you. So we, it is for free, we're not charging a registration fee and we request all of you to generously donate towards the festival so that 
the continuous flow of knowledge and information is free and seamless. Ladies and gentlemen, the Himalayas, an ecological battle, Trevor Price and Stephen Alter in conversation. Over to you, Trevor and Stephen. Thank you very much, Sharupa. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here at JLF Colorado in its first virtual manifestation. And it's wonderful to be talking with you, Trevor, uh, about all of your work in the Himalaya, uh, particularly focusing on birds. Um, I was going to start with, with a very simple, uh, but perhaps a complicated question. But um, whenever I travel through the Himalaya, um, the presence of birds indicates to me that this is a healthy, vibrant environment that's there. And I wonder, as you traveled through the Himalaya yourself, what are some of the things that birds tell us about a particular environment, about a particular landscape? What do they indicate to you? Uh, is it, a, is it a, a vibrant landscape? Are there problems under the surface? Uh, what sort of things do the birds indicate to you as you uh, observe them, study them, uh, document their behavior and their biology? Yeah, that's a very deep question actually to start with. I think uh, the first thing to notice is the Himalayas are so varied. So the answer to that question would differ if we're talking about the Eastern Himalaya, uh, compared to the Western Himalaya, for example. But uh, in general, I think uh, it's misleading to think it's a vibrant system. We tend to visit uh, protected areas and well-protected areas where it is very vibrant and we've got um, a pretty well intact fauna and flora still. But that's confined to these uh, fairly small pockets. In the West, um, there's not that much natural area left. Uh, you know, you might mention Corbett um, National Park, which would have an intact fauna. But you can see effects of land use change all over the West in the uh, bird makeup. And in the East, uh, we're facing, I mean, I hate to be too, too uh, depressing to start with, but we're facing a big problem with uh, hunting, which is causing a reduction in fauna outside of some specific protected areas. So I think we're a bit biased because we tend to go to the places that still are very healthy and intact. Great. Yeah, and I guess, um, you know, in a, perhaps in a more general sense, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're all talking about the effects of climate change, the effects of land use, forest degradation, all of those uh, issues that are, are foremost in the minds of most conservationists. And as you um, have sort of walked through those areas, you've uh, experienced, uh, you know, different landscapes that have been degraded uh, to one degree or another. What are some of the things that you notice about the bird life and perhaps the other uh, species that those birds interact with and the relationships that they um, uh, have with those different species? I know you've written, for instance, about uh, the presence of ants and how that affects uh, the presence of birds in particular parts, particularly in the lower Himalaya. Um, what are those relationships and how did those then, in a sense, relate to our human presence and our human intrusions in the Himalaya? Yeah, again, it's a very deep question. Uh, you know, it's still possible, I believe, in Himalaya, particularly in the East, to study uh, species interactions and where species live in the context of a pre-human era. So you mentioned um, ants and birds. Uh, we believe that ants and birds interact with each other to determine which species occur where. And that seems to be uh, a prehistorical uh, interaction that hasn't been affected by humans. Uh, like I said, you can go to areas, particularly in the East, that still seem to be fairly intact. But uh, everywhere, you know, we'd like to talk actually about what I now call COVID, which is probably more serious than COVID, 
which is climate change, over-harvesting, pollution, habitat loss, invasive species and disease as the six threats to nature. And um, in the Himalaya, you know, we're missing a lot of information about some of those threats. But if you asked for a specific one, you could talk about the invasive species Lantana, which has converted whole areas to, uh, you know, basically um, uh, scrub that uh, is not useful for grazing uh, or for wild animals and has resulted in the increase of some frugivorous bird species and the decrease of the uh, insectivorous ones that used to be there. And you know that's invasive species and we could uh, talk about over harvesting um, and we've got some information about this you know for example uh, obviously things like loss of tigers from places in the past creates a huge ramification through the food chain and we could talk about um, climate change, which is probably uh, one of the smaller effects on its own at the moment. But, um, you know, when we go beyond that, looking at things like disease, pollution, uh, we have uh, limited data. Nevertheless, the point is that you can see human impacts uh, through these various factors all over the Himalaya. But again, I want to emphasize that there are still plenty of natural areas left and uh, these natural areas are still it looks like fairly intact some large national parks great yeah well let me let me go from the very more specific to a more general and perhaps a personal question i uh, i'm an amateur bird watcher and don't pretend to be uh, someone who who could give you the latin names for uh, various species, but I've, I've been watching birds for, for a good part of my lifetime. And you've, you've written, uh, you and your students have written scientific papers on a species like uh, Hume's warbler, which I know as a very tiny bird that never sits still. And uh, for me, it's very difficult to tell what the difference is between a Hume's warbler and other leaf warblers and other uh, birds of that size and uh, disposition. But what I would be interested in is the way in which you as scientists, first of all, pick a species like that to focus on. And then what are some of the techniques? What are some of the technologies? Uh, what are some of the approaches that you have uh, to studying that particular bird? Right. So, I mean, again, and that's another deep question. Uh, you know, why study a common bird, which uh, currently actually is all over Delhi, no one is noticing. It spends its winter in Delhi and its summer in, in the Himalaya. And uh, of course, by studying a common bird like that, it's almost a uh, canary in the gold mine, if, if you like, in the coal mine, in that uh, you can see if changes are happening and you can get a big enough sample of birds to, to see what's happening. So our approach has been for the last 30 years actually to what we do is we go to a, a selected area. Let me see if I can find you know a picture of a, the sort of place we would go to. Um, so this would be the sort of a crew uh, and um, we would arrive in uh, Manali or Kashmir uh, in April and our basic um, procedure has been to uh, catch a sample of, of birds, put colour bands onto these birds, and I don't have a picture of a bird actually in the hand, and then we uh, find the nests of all these birds and we simply document their breeding success uh, each year and ask how well we're doing. And, um, I guess the way it's worked is we've always come up with a specific problem uh, early on. It was just what is the breeding biology and which species occur where? And as time has gone on, of course, over the last uh, 20 years, we've seen so many big changes that we've been able to use that baseline data to talk about the changes that we've observed. So uh, I, if you'd like me to carry on with this, we could just mention, you know, um, some of the uh, if we just look at this particular bird, 
This is the bird that's caused you so many problems to identify. Uh, and it's a uh, beautiful little bird, I'm sure you would admit. And uh, if any of you need a cue to identify it, if you just want to go out into Connaught Circus, it should be calling in a tree there right now. And it has a uh, little white wing bar uh, on its wing, which has been a focus of our work because we'd like to know why this species has one and another one doesn't. But that's a good way to tell it apart from these other species. And um, one of the two, two features that we've discovered about this species is that in um, the, the elevation at which it breeds, uh, the lower elevation at which it breeds is now higher up the mountain substantially, maybe about 50 or 60 meters higher up it's moved in the last 30 years. What, what exactly, Trevor, takes this bird from Connaught Place to the Himalaya? Is it simply the breeding or is it following insects? Uh, what, what dictates its migration pattern? Yeah, well, it's an insectivorous bird. And if you're at 3,000 meters in Himalayas right now, there's not a lot of insects to be found. So it spends the winter in the plains of India, like many species do. But what happens is in May, uh, it warms up, all the leaves come out and you get a huge food flush. So that means these birds can raise four young uh, easily. Whereas if they stayed in the plains of India, the amount of food available to them would be much less. So they basically fly, fly up to the Himalaya because there's a lot more food to provide their young, uh, but they can't stay there in the winter. You were talking when we were having a conversation earlier about the, the way in which, um, for instance, a, the diversity of a particular plant species or a flower like the rhododendron, uh, or uh, we might pick um, the, the birch trees and the way in which the uh, calyx of those birch trees attacks, uh, attracts different insects and things like that. Um, I think it's something that we often don't understand, uh, you know, at least on, in layman's terms, is the idea of these relations. When a rhododendron blooms, it attracts insects, which attracts the birds, and so on and so forth. Can you give some examples of that from your experience of the way in which um, there is this sort of synergy, of, I don't like that word, but synergy perhaps uh, between different species in different kingdoms of the animal, uh, of the uh, natural world. Yeah, I suppose I, I suppose the most, you know, technically what we call is a food chain. So you have plants and then you have things called primary consumers that eat the plants. Then you have secondary consumers that eat the primary consumers. And then you have tertiary consumers that eat the secondary consumers that eat the primary consumers. And in the Himalaya, that's what we're studying with this uh, warbler. You know, it basically breeds where there's birch trees. So you don't see it in Nepal, for example. And uh, it, the birch comes into leaf and immediately starts to get attacked by various uh, insects, not notably moths, butterflies, and sawfly larvae. So the caterpillars are an enormous food source for this bird. It just eats lots of them and feeds them to its young. And then, you know, of considerable interest to us is about half the nests of this bird subsequently get eaten by other things, including snakes and um, crows and uh, weasels and even some, um, uh, some, some weird land birds like woodcocks. So we've got this chain, you know, each of which is dependent on each other. And one of the really uh, big effects on biodiversity across the world at the moment is happening because species at the top of the chain, like uh, tigers or eagles, things that eat other things but themselves don't get eaten, if they disappear, and they tend to disappear because they're rare, then the thing below them gets common and the thing below those becomes rare again. So you have this cascading effect through the food chain. And what we're trying to study is 
if any of the four links that I mentioned in the food chain change in response to climate, how does that ramify through to all the other species? Yeah, it's, it's fascinating the way, in, as you say, this sort of cascading effect uh, is there, whether it's you're talking about wolves in Yellowstone Park or whatever uh, species. That, and often it's on a much more, uh, what many people would consider a mundane level, but perhaps a more exciting level when it comes to warblers and uh, other species like that. But one of the things that's always fascinated me uh, in the Himalaya and reading scientific accounts of the Himalaya has been scientists' interest in the sense that uh, liminal zone uh, zones uh, and then finally into rock and ice. And with the birch, one of the things that I, as a trekker, uh, I always thought of the birches as the last species, the, the yeah. final species that you saw before you went above the tree line. And yeah. Over the years, as I, I read more about the way in which life returned to the Himalaya after the last ice age and uh, you know, new species or species that had retreated started to move forward, I suddenly realized that the birches are actually not the last species, they're the first species. They are the advance guard uh, moving forward. And many of those birds too, I would like to think are sort of the advance guard of life uh, as things warm, as glaciers retreat, snow caps retreat, um, that that these these are the species that are leading the way. Am I am I being completely fanciful, or or do you think there might be something in that? Yeah, well, they were probably in the sense that you know during the glaciations they'd be the least retreating of the species. That's for sure. sure. Birch, you know, flourishes where there's deep snow. Uh, and so you'll see it on um, north facing slopes in the West Himalaya, whereas on the south facing slope, you've got uh, oak and um, uh, I'm blanking, but primarily oak would be the south facing slope and, uh, and the conifers would go higher. So birch is the species that really likes to be buried under snow for a long time, as is rhododendron, of course. So rhododendron lies above the birch. Um, so yes, it would be the as it would be the one that would be closest to the glacier, and it'd be the one that would move as the glacier retreated uh, first. And these birds would presumably move with it. There is an issue that's worth mentioning, though, which is that the Himalaya is, as we know, a really rugged topography. Uh, I guess we haven't really pointed out that the Himalaya is, you know, by far the biggest mountain range. In the world, it's got um, the hundred hundred tallest peaks in the world, and um, so when something like the ice retreats, uh, goes further north, or things, as you you know, as as the Himalaya itself, as we were talking about before, sort of runs east west uh, until you get to Uttarakhand, where it turns to northwest, and. Um, if you think about glaciers retreating along that northwest arc, the birds and the plants have to follow it, but they have to go over fairly few river valleys to do so. And, um, you know, don't forget that the last ice age only ended about 10 to 12,000 years ago. So there may be some lags there simply because it's taken time for these things to get across all these river valleys. Mm. Yeah, well, I think that that idea that the Himalaya are this arc that goes from a, a latitude that's south of Delhi uh, to uh, up into Ladakh, I mean, perhaps equal to Delhi, if not south of Delhi, if you're, you're in the northeast. And yeah. then, you, then you sort of curve northward as you move west. Um, I think that's something that obviously affects the biodiversity and there's much more biodiversity in the east, eastern part of the Himalaya. Um, but do you think there's also, if, if we were to think of the vulnerability of different parts of the Himalaya, do you think that the Northwest is more vulnerable to environmental change, climate change, those sort of things than the East, simply because there, there's more to, more to it in the Northeast as against in the Northwest? Yeah, well, I mean, the reason the Northwest is more vulnerable 
is partly because it's been exploited. Uh, in the land use change has gone on for much longer. Uh, so there's much less pristine habitat. It's almost impossible to find anywhere at 2000 meters that's pristine. And the second reason is that it's gonna warm faster. The Northwest Himalaya is one of the fastest warming regions of the world. So the Eastern Himalaya, you know, we've got a lack of data there. There's not even very many climate stations there, but we can be pretty sure that it's gonna be uh, better buffered unless there's a lot more land use change, simply because there's bigger areas that have yet to be uh, exploited. In terms of, you know, uh, what if you had intact ecosystems in both places and then suddenly um, started to disrupt them, the fact the East has twice as many species as the West, would that uh, lead to uh, greater stability or not? And the, the point, the answer is you can't really tell. It's very hard to tell what would happen if you remove a tiger from the East or a wolf from the West, because there's so many uh, elements to the chain. So uh, this might be a good place though to just talk about, you know, impending climate change. I just made this figure yesterday, which uh, I think is something that we should really highlight in this talk, which is the predictions of the International Governmental Panel, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, so this is a prediction based on a scenario of how much carbon dioxide is added to the atmosphere and it's a scenario that we're currently on track for and this is the, the whole point of this is that if you look um, the east Himalaya is going to get wetter in this particular region uh, which is uh, the Bhutan Sikkim region it's going to get much wetter the west Himalaya is going to get drier so what's happening, which is something that's sort of fairly typical over the world, is wet areas are getting wetter and drier areas are getting drier. Well, this is exactly the opposite to what we want because we've already got too many floods in the east and too many droughts in the west. So I think, you know, this is one of the big predictions of climate change. Uh, currently, climate change is probably having less effect than some of these other threats I mentioned. But going forward, it's going to have a huge impact uh, and, you know, unless we can do something about it, it's going to be pretty disastrous for the Himalaya. Right. No, I think that the, um, um, the Himalaya are so vulnerable, partly because they have such a variety of different microclimates and uh, elevations and all of that. So once you, it's, it's almost a sort of cascading effect just in terms of the, uh, you know, water resources, uh, yeah. forest cover, and so on and so forth. It, 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 you, you change one thing and uh, either you get a flood or you get a forest fire and it's disaster. But um, I think to use a, a line from Monty Python, uh, now for something entirely different. Um, as a na all naturalists are adventurers. All naturalists are uh, explorers who go uh, maybe not always to places where nobody else has been, but they go to places that are often um, off, off the map uh, in one way or the other. And you as an ornithologist, as a scientist studying ecology, uh, environmental change, have been to some places that are, are in a sense off the map. And you were also describing experiences that you've had uh, being taken hostage uh, in Kashmir, uh, some of the fascinating people you've met uh, in other places. And I think it would be fascinating to hear that side of being a field biologist, uh, you know, other than the birds, of course, which are fascinating and the other species that are there. Uh, within our own species, you've obviously experienced and encountered a great deal of diversity. So some of those stories I think would be fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, I don't really know where to start. Maybe uh, as a, a novelist, you could do a better job here. But um, uh, the whole, you know, the quick, sometimes you do wonder why you go back when you sit in a tent and it rains for three days. But, you know, the draw of the Himalayas is incredible. Uh, 
just the experience of being out in the mountains is amazing. And uh, I think, you know, just to carry on with this theme for a minute, there's a tremendous scientific justification. You know, it's the most diverse place. I want to just mention this. It's like uh, 8%, you know, which is what, one in um, 12 of all bird species or something can be found in the Himalaya. I mean, a huge number of bird species. And it's so little studied, the Himalaya are your grist. You can go anywhere and do anything. And it's been a lot of fun to do that. But of course, you know, there have been various uh, uh, stories I could recount. You mentioned being taken hostage, which people find as the most adventurous one. And this happened um, in 1991 when the, uh, you know, the beginning of the uh, uprising in Kashmir. Um, you know, I could make a longer or short story out of this, but uh, the bottom line is that we were taken hostage and um, we escaped after six days. Uh, and live to tell the tale because I'm still here. Um, Which I was, part of Kashmir were you in at that point? Was that near Palgam, which is you know one of a hundred miles sort of east of southeast of Srinagar? So it was near Palgam, and uh, we were taken hostage, and uh, you know obviously lost everything. Uh, and I didn't think I'd ever be able to go back, but uh, you know it opened up again in in the mid two thousands. So we were there in 2006, 2008, 2009, and uh, it was very interesting to see the changes that had happened. So yeah, anyway, uh, one of the changes that had happened was that the when I went back, the uh, rest house had burnt down or been bombed since since the first time. And uh, you don't really want to work with me because that's happened three times. Uh, this particular rest house is in um, North Bengal, and that has also been bombed <laughs> since I was there. And uh, I've done a lot of work in Andhra Pradesh in South India, but the rest house that I used to work in there has also been bombed. So, you know, it's basically like, don't go to a rest house that I've stayed in before. <laughs> um, I think some of the other stories, uh, one of the stories I love is... Uh, you know, getting caught in massive rainstorms. So there was one time in Sikkim, and I was there with uh, this uh, good friend of mine, Dan J. Mohan, who's now the director of the Wildlife Institute of India. And it's been he and I who've been doing all these surveys, and I was there with him and his student, Ashumi Ghosh, who uh, was doing a PhD on these warblers at the time. And uh, we were camped at a lovely place called Sachin in uh, Kanchenjunga National Park, a place I recommend everyone to go to. Wonderful place. And it started to rain and we thought we'd better get out of there. And all I remember about this vividly was Mashumi telling a story about getting caught for 10 minutes in a rainstorm in uh, Dehradun. And as the rain increased and increased, she got quieter and quieter, and she suddenly realized that we were just going to be washed away. And we got back, we finally got back to Yuxham, and everything was soaked. And uh, the camera, the watch, binoculars were all stopped working, couldn't see anything. And over about three months, they came back one by one. The camera came back last, and I was able to use it again, <laughs> but it took three months. So we've had lots of uh, experiences like that. I, I, you know, rather than mention the hostages, maybe I'll just mention one more if you want one more adventure. Sure. Yeah. Um, after we couldn't go to Kashmir, we went to Pakistan to carry on with some of our work there. And uh, during that time there, um, we got robbed by some uh, shepherds. And uh, uh, what, so then after that, we, we, we moved back to India and I started working in Lahul, which is just across the mountain from, uh, you know, the Himalayas run east-west, or sort of east-west there. And behind the Himalayas, we've got Ladakh, uh, Ladakh. And there are these rivers that run east-west, uh, carving valleys that have got really interesting bird populations in them that are quite unique. So we started to work there and this is such a remote area that 
people had not been there very much. And I, uh, I, I took a bus down the uh, Chenab Valley, which in itself was an experience because it kept getting stuck. The army had built the road, but the rivers themselves, they'd never put bridges on. So the bus got stuck in every river. And uh, yeah, that, that's quite an exciting story in itself. But we ended up at some very remote place and I wanted to go up and see the birds. And I started to go up the mountain and all of a sudden I saw like several, uh, maybe about 50 people coming towards me, uh, shouting and waving things. And I thought about this time when I was robbed in Pakistan, that was very uncomfortable. So I started to run. And of course, here's an old man running and there's 50 villagers who've lived at this elevation forever. So they caught up with me in about 10 minutes. And, uh, you know, my heart was beating fast, but in the end they told me that uh, uh, they uh, just wanted to see what I was doing. They thought I was a Pakistani insurgent. Uh, anyway, that's just one of the many stories that I could tell about um, encountering various people. Maybe, I, you know, you did ask me about people I've met, and maybe I would just mention um, this particular rather amazing guy, Suresh Rana, who lives in a village in Kashmir, right on the Himachal border. And he's from this very uh, remote area that still, unusually for India, has no road or uh, electricity. And he self-taught himself all the plants of the Himalaya, which he can identify. And he can, by the way, Stephen say both the scientific and the common name to each of these plants. So he, uh, it's just one of those, you know, savants, really. He's just a really smart guy, self-taught himself everything. And he's become one of my closest collaborators and friends there. And he now works for the, um, uh, him, I've forgotten the name of it, but it's, he works in Ley for one of the government Himalayan mountain institutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think one of the fascinating things as, as I've traveled through the Himalaya is the way in which, I mean, we, of course, from the West come uh, to uh, an environment like this with uh, Linnaean taxonomy and all of our Latin names and all of that. But I think one of the fascinating things is that each of these regions often has a taxonomy of its own. And uh, the to me, the best example is uh, in the... Um, region of uh, northern West Bengal and uh, Sikkim, the Lepcha people uh, have a name for virtually every bird. Um, and it's a, it's a very descriptive name. It, it may touch on the color, but it also touches on the distribution, whether it's in a cold region or a warm region and all of that. And that's a taxonomy that probably predates Linnaeus. I, I can't say that for sure, but it, it probably does, or at least elements of it do. And I think it's fascinating the way in which different people in different parts of the Himalaya uh, name, identify, and describe uh, species that uh, may be found in, you know, three quarters of the mountains, if not throughout the mountains in that way. Um, yeah, that's, that's a very good point. And of course, that knowledge is being lost. Uh, and we should also make the point that there's a lot of medicinal plants in the Himalaya. And there's this local indigenous, indigenous knowledge of this stuff that uh, we really should be making an effort to, to preserve. I had just one last, before we finish, one, one question, which I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I think that one of the things that I've often found when I'm traveling and I'm searching for something, um, you know, I may go to a particular place looking for a particular temple or a shrine or a landmark or maybe I'm going to some place where I want to see a, you know a rufous neck hornbill or uh, whatever it may be but I found in almost every instance when I go to a place looking for one thing I find something else uh, in fact you find many things that you you weren't expecting to find and I wonder if you have any experiences like that where you went specifically to find a particular species or a, a particular uh, you know habitat or whatever it may be and then came upon something else that was perhaps utterly unrelated but equally meaningful 
Yeah, that does put me on the spot. Um, certainly, we've had many, many surprises. Let's, let's not forget the East Himalaya are very poorly explored. So we've had many, many surprises finding birds in places we didn't expect to see them. Uh, uh, I can't think uh, off the top of my head of something that's similar to what you say, but uh, you know, I've always been amazed at every place I've gone to because I've seen things that I didn't expect to see. I mean, you know, uh, who would ever expect to see a kingfisher in the middle of a wood? I'd never thought of this, but there's this beautiful uh, pygmy kingfisher that feeds on insects in woods. So again and again, you know, we've had these amazing experiences. Uh, probably, you know, the most exciting natural history experiences I've had have been encounters with bears. Um, so that's an unexpected, I wouldn't say bonus, but we've had, a, you know, some, some quite close encounters with them. And I think actually, if I had to, you know, talk about the biggest spine shivering moment of my career, it was seeing a leopard sitting, you know, out in the open on a rock, uh, just about 30 or 40 yards away from me, which then uh, went like a cat and started to crawl towards me as if it was about to uh, have, a, have a meal. So, you know, there's been lots of great unexpected experiences, uh, but I think uh, the really exciting things have been Probably the most exciting scientific things have been finding something that you predict will be there uh, based on your understanding of the natural history of the system and then finding it there. Mm. Mm. And to know that you were right, or at least you, you made the right guess, uh, educated. Uh, I, I think it's that it, it tells you that you, you do understand something about what's going on. Mm. Uh, I might just mention this anecdote because I really, I felt really, I think it's probably my proudest moment in biology was, you know, as I pointed out, we usually color ban these birds and the birds, these little warblers that we study, in the winter, they also hold territories. So the one that you see in Connaught Circus probably owns about six trees in Connaught Circus and it won't let any other birds come in. And so, you know, some birds are healthier than others and they can occupy a bigger territory. And what happens in the winter, and this is a surprise to some people, is that a lot of birds die because they can't find enough food. So I was studying this bird and birds on big territories would stop and preen and have a rest, whereas birds on small territories would just feed from one moment in the morning to the late at night. And I was following this bird which I thought was a small territory bird and it stopped to preen. I said, what? Everything's gone wrong. I don't understand anything. And then I looked at its color bands and I'd somehow switched birds at one point and I was actually following the bird from a big territory that was uh, intruding on the small bird's territory. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, really told me that I had a, a sense for what was going on in the system. And I, I think in still many ways, that's my proudest moment in biology. <laughs> Yeah, no, and and uh, uh, I think there is something. There is a sort of epiphany uh, to those moments that uh, matches uh, whether it's a literary epiphany or a spiritual epiphany. It it yeah. uh, you certainly the light bulb goes off in yeah. one way or the other. Uh, As a friend of mine said, you know, they're great moments. Pity they don't happen more often. <laughs> yes, I, I wish I wish you could have those every day, but of course that's not. <laughs> <laughs> That's not allowed. I remember for me, uh, when I went to Eagle Nest uh, Sanctuary, we were, of course went looking for birds. And the, the magical moment was when I suddenly saw elephants at 3,000 meters. And I, I had never imagined that elephants would get up to 3,000 meters. And there they were. And uh, you thought, oops, uh, <laughs> the world has turned upside down for a moment here. But uh, it was also very, very exciting. That yeah, way. that's, you know, that's, that's an interesting, I mean, just to mention elephants for a moment. Uh, we used to stay at a place in Eagle Nest. And uh, the day after we left, the elephants came in and trampled it to pieces. That's at Sesney. But the elephants themselves, you know, they've only really moved up there because uh, of all the, uh, the habitat and the sand has been lost. 
I'm not really sure how much they went above 3,000 meters until quite recently. Well, I think we've, we've come to the end of our session. It's been wonderful talking with you, Trevor. I wish we could go on for another hour or so, but I, I, I'm told that time is out. So thank you so much, and thank you to JLF Colorado for uh, hosting this. Well, I hope, I mean, obviously I could talk about the Himalaya and our adventures forever, and I hope to uh, get a chance to meet you guys in person, and maybe we can all get together in Delhi one day and sit around the table and have a good chat. But thanks very much for inviting me. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Stephen. That was a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for sharing all those stories and about all the rest houses getting bombed and all the birds and the territories that they have. Wow, I think you encouraged as well as excited many of us to pick up your book and start reading. Thank you. Thank you. That was really nice. Thank you all for watching and being a great audience. Once again, we'd like to thank all our official partners. This session was presented to you by the JLF Colorado in partnership with the University of Chicago Center in Delhi. We hope you enjoyed this conversation and we'll log back on tomorrow at 6.15 p.m. MST and 6, which will be 6.45 a.m. IST to watch our stellar list of speakers and the great sessions that have been specially curated for you. Thank you and see you tomorrow. call the Jaipur Literature Festival a living library or perhaps even a library of life. Do join us as we share the excitement of ideas and of debate and dialogue of the adventures of science, of the joys of poetry and music, the consolations of philosophy, the sense of literature and of life. about the festival in India, um, the scale of it, the energy of it, and I just love the fact that there is this effort to bring it to um, other cities in the world. It's a variety of topics. It's meaningful. I'm just excited. I'm, I'm feeling uh, like I've learned a lot, a lot to think about, and I uh, appreciate JLF coming here. Going forward, it would be a, a very good thing to do for the community to have this event on an annual basis. I think that when you hear so many different voices and perspectives about the South Asian diaspora and many other issues, you learn that there's a lot of history that you're not taught every day. Um, and I think that that's important to bring in today's world. I was actually really surprised by the camaraderie I experienced here and the way that people at JLF, both attendees and other panelists, seem to really connect profoundly to literature and care about it. In 2020, our live version of JLF has been laid to waste because of COVID-19. However, nothing's going to stop us from coming in the way of bringing our writers and speakers to you in Boulder, Colorado, Houston, New York, 
and Toronto, Canada. Workouts bringing India to the world and the world to India through Indian art and culture for over 30 years. One of Team Workouts' signature events, the Z Jaipur Literature Festival, is the world's largest free festival of its kind. With daily interactive sessions, lively debate and dialogue, and international music performances every night, it's no wonder the festival attracts over 500,000 visitors a year. The Jaipur Bookmark, an international B2B event for the publishing industry, happens during the Z Jaipur Literature Festival and sees a confluence of publishers, writers and literary agents. Teamwork Arts, producers of the Z Jaipur Literature Festival have taken the flavour of the festival to international shores with vibrant events in the UK, Australia and the US. Teamwork Arts takes India's artistic diversity to the world with almost 12 festivals of India across continents in a stunning array in over 40 cities. A feast for the senses, these are spectacles of dance, music, cinema, theatre, literature and so much more. In each of these places, Teamwork Arts' colourful festivals of India are the high points of the annual cultural calendars, be it confluence in Australia, India by the Bay in Hong Kong, India by the Nile in Egypt, Iron India in Chicago, Shared History in South Africa, India in the Sunshine City in Zimbabwe, Edinburgh Fringe Festival, Kalao Tsavam in Singapore, Sarang in South Korea, Festivals in Abu Dhabi, Shanghai, Sweden, the list is dizzying. The Jazz India Circuit is an endeavour by Teamwork Arts to spread the word and sound of jazz across the country. The 2017-18 season, four festivals across three cities featuring over 25 stellar artists from India and around the world, including Jojo Mayer and Nerve, drummer-singer Jameson Ross and Dave Weckl, who collaborated with the talented Mohini Day. The Mahindra Kabira Festival celebrates the spirit, lyric and verse of the 15th century mystic poet Kabir in his birthplace, the historic city of Varanasi. Kabir's poetry is about inclusiveness. Mahindra Kabira brings to music lovers an unforgettable experience of listening to leading exponents of the classical Banaras Gharana and rich folk traditions of music on the legendary banks of the mighty river Ganges, along with sessions on art and literature, specially curated walks with famous local residents and delectable local cuisine. Sacred celebrates the spiritual through music and its ability to heal. International artists collaborate with world music exponents from India amongst the most incredible desert settings on the banks of the Pushkar Lake. Heritage walks, meditation, talks and workshops are part of this weekend experience. Teamwork Arts so promotes and recognizes the best of Indian theatre through the Mahindra Excellence in Theatre Awards. The Meta Week in Delhi is an enthralling showcase of the 10 best nominated plays shortlisted from numerous entries received from across the country and across languages. The Meta Lifetime Achievement Award has been presented to leading lights of India's theatre industry. For the young and the young at heart, the Ishara International Puppet Theatre Festival brings local and international performances to audiences across several Indian cities. While the Multi-City Kahani Festival features interactive storytelling sessions and workshops, championing the power of imagination, Bollywood Love Story, a musical, our international touring productions such as Bollywood Extravaganza and Flamenco India have sold out shows across Europe, Egypt, Russia and Spain. Expressions International Contemporary Dance Festival showcases Indian and international productions bringing together several dance genres for Indian audiences. Teamwork Arts Celebrating the Arts For more information Visit www.teamworkarts.com
festival like this is a beautiful indication of the kind of uh, thing that I, I truly, truly believe in and I think makes our society uh, more whole and more pure. We do not take it for granted that Boulder was chosen as the first North American uh, satellite festival. Um, it's a huge honor we will not forget and we are enriched because of it. We are indebted to the, both the local and international people that came together to make that happen. And um, we hope it's a tradition that continues for decades to come. Literary festivals like this one build up an environment and an ecosystem to nurture readers and to promote the business of books. They provide an invaluable forum for writers to connect with other creative people. Uh, we sit there peering into uh, those uh, electronic uh, uh, grids in front of our eyes uh, and it only increases the desire to hit, see the real thing in the flesh, uh, to actually hear an author speak firsthand, to read from their work, to hear the tones of their voice uh, modulate as they read their most treasured passages of prose. Uh, for us it's special, this was our mothership and it continues to be. The other editions that we have across the United States are smaller versions, different programming but smaller versions. I think everywhere I've ever lived, I always looked for the library. They come to the library because they want to be with people. Corporations are not people in the library. People are people, right? And so being able to come in and participate and learn and control that learning experience is, is what, we, what we offer to the community. That's a beautiful thing. Um, it can develop into something amazing. We want them to recognize that they have the agency and the potential to create change and have a voice. To become what they hope to be, to empower them to realize their aspirations. No matter who they are, no matter what age they are, no matter what their background or ability is. We're going to learn together, right? And you know what? Not just me, because I want to create together, but I think we want to create together. Give us your knowledge. Give us what you do best. Give us your culture, give us good feedback, give us bad feedback, give us any feedback. Um, let us grow with you. Just come and ask to. Ask a librarian, we're all here waiting to help you. To work together, to collaborate, and to come up with a larger, louder voice as a collective. We are bolder together. We are bolder. Okay, wait. Somos bolder juntos. <laughs> we are bolder. 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 Together. 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 <laughs> We're bolder together. We're bolder together.